good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Antonio Roca, um, and I'm privileged to be speaking to you today. Um, we're here to uh, introduce everybody to an extraordinary individual, but before we get there, I'd like to talk to you about the edutainment series and the distinguished lecture series that Ave Academic of Virtual Education in collaboration with Ralph Krauss from Pinecrest, Nevada, um, has put together in order to bring real world experiences, real world speakers, distinguished speakers to students all across the Academica uh, networks. Um, we have distinguished lectures in the areas of science, mathematics, photography, journalism, politics, and of course, charter schools. And that's why we're here today, where I get the privilege to introduce your uh, speaker for the day. Um, his name is Fernando Sulueta, who I am um, privileged to have met about 17 years ago um, when I joined the charter school movement. Right now, we have um, an international footprint. We have students across seven time zones, about 5,000 students that are participating. We have students from Italy, from France, Spain, all along the East Coast, Texas, Nevada, California, um, here to listen to a little bit about how we got started in this charter school movement, how Academica be became the largest charter school support organization in the country. And uh, of course, it is because of a leader, He's an attorney, he's an accountant, he's also a musician, a husband, a father, a leader, um, someone that inspires, someone that pushes for excellence. And because of him, uh, all of our networks were created. So uh, without further ado, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce my friend, Fernando Sulueta. Thank you, thanks. Thanks, Antonio. It's great to be here with you guys, and I will hope to meet that guy he was describing any day now. <laughs> but uh, so, so you're here today, and, and, and welcome to the 5,000 students and, and the seven different time zones that are out there. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's great to be in, connected in this way. And I guess the, the time zone's all the way in Europe, right? Correct. Okay, so we have students. Well, I think the only one we were not able to get in was Hawaii, believe it or not. We have a, high, uh, a school in Hawaii, and you should all go visit. So we could do like a field trip. It's a, it's a bit of a bu bus ride, but you're gonna have a great time when you get there. It'll be a few weeks to get there, and um, I think you'll love it. And uh, but that's, I think the, the Hawaii school open. It's called Kama, Kamalani Academy, so it's, or something like that. It has an actual Hawaiian name, and it's it's cool. It's it, I've seen. I haven't been there yet, but I would love to see it because it's a beautiful pictures and uh, you can go surfing so it has a lot of benefits the uh, so as Antonio was saying we began this journey this charter school journey here in Florida about 20 years ago so it was before any of you were born right because what grade levels are you all in here seniors seniors so only a few of you are over 20 years old right <laughs> I'm just that was a bad joke the uh, the so none of you were around, you know, like uh, when, when the first charter school was started. In fact, when I started the first charter school, which was called Somerset Academy, which you all love, right, because I were here in Matter, and you don't, and I, and I fully understand. There's a nice rivalry that goes on between the schools that we work with, and that was part of, that's intentional. That was because, you know, we were trying to build a different system and a, and a cool one at that, but, with, but including... Uh, it was all based on a fundamental concept, which is that the existing traditional or the district public school system that we're that many of you may have gone to schools in before you joined Matter Academy, um, that had there were a lot of people going back as far as 30 and even 40 years ago that had serious questions about how well that system was developing, and the reason is that it was operated on the basis of the government providing educational services in a model that resembles a monopoly, where there's one provider and where parents, the consumers, you, our consumers, 
education consumers right now, you didn't have a choice. So I grew up for most of my life in that type of a system, which was that parents were told where you take your child to be educated by the state. And that, believe it or not, you know, I, I came to the United States when I was two years old as an immigrant with my parents. I don't remember it, but they brought me here. And my mom, when I was little, used to always tell me, I used to ask her, well, why did you leave Cuba? It was, you know, it was a beautiful place, and it had big, big mangoes and avocados on the trees, and everything was, was, I don't know if you have Cuban, any of you have Cuban parents or grandparents, but everything was bigger and better there when, when they lived there. And um, so I said, if it is such a wonderful place, why'd you leave? One of the main reasons was, she said, you know, they passed a law while I was, while we were there, when the, when the communist government took over, they passed a law taking away the rights of parents to decide how and where to educate their children. So we came to the United States. And guess what? When they got here, they found out that the government told you where and how to educate your children, which was very ironic, with an exception. They, don't, what they didn't have in Cuba is that here, at least in the United States, you could still buy a private education. And that was available to a lot of people, right? Except it's only 9% of parents can afford a private school. And that, that was a big issue. So in America, where we have all this freedom and where you can go choose the car you drive or the shoes you wear or the restaurant you go to, you were still told, before any of you were born, you were told that you had to take your child to this one school and only that one school where you live or near where you live. It's called education by zip code, basically. You, got, you were educated based on where you live and, uh, and by the government telling you where you, uh, where you would go. And then beyond that, so you only had one provider, one company. It was a governmental company, and that was the only one that was giving an education to, to you, meaning to your parents and to, uh, and, and to those who went to the district or the traditional public schools back then. And people were starting to wonder about the wisdom of that. And for example, when I went to college, I learned because I studied business and I studied economics. And you, you, some of you are in civics classes right now, correct? Or what class are you in currently? American government. Okay, so this is a topic you should cover anyway in it. But I think we can all agree that there's a fundamental understanding in economics that, e that monopolies are not a good thing, right? We have laws against people having monopolies. People are worried right now, for example, about Amazon and whether that organization, because it controls more than half of all the retail activity on the internet, whether that's a good thing. Because when that much power and economic control becomes consolidated into one or very few providers, we know from all the studies and also from the reality of living in those environments that you get really bad outcomes for the consumers because you don't have a choice, so it's take it or leave it. And that was the situation with education. So we were not really, you know, people were not happy with that status quo. We had seen the beneficial effects of getting rid of monopolies and one of the, one of the ones that I lived through, for example, was when with, with the phone system. And all of you nowadays have these fancy, you know, you have smartphones, cell phones, you know, access to a lot of different products sold by many different companies. All of them are named Apple or Samsung, unfortunately, but, but there are, there's a lot of variety. And um, none of that existed when I was a kid. We had one phone in the house, and it was like wired to the wall, and it was provided by one company, and it was called AT&T. Which one did you think? Western Union, good question. I don't know. Uh, you, you guys are the government, so you probably know better than I do what the history of that, what, what predates AT&T. But AT&T was the biggest, was the sole, pretty much the monopoly nationally on delivery of phone service to people's households. You didn't own your own phone. They, they rented it to you. When I was a kid, we had that one phone. It wasn't very good. You paid a lot of money every month just to rent it. If you moved, they, you lost your phone number. It didn't go with you. The, the monopoly, AT&T, controlled it all. And then the government eventually said, we need to break this up. 
And they did. They created what are called the Baby Bells. They created Southern Bell South and other companies across, seven of them, I think, across the nation to divide up the whole AT&T monopoly. And that, in turn, allowed for a lot of progress. It eventually led to what we're seeing today with the proliferation of, of cell phone technology and, and, many, and all of us having many companies that can offer you phone service. Well, something different than that, but... But, but with the same mindset is what drove the creation of the type of school you go to. And that is the charter school model. That is a model that, that arose when we realized that America's public schools were struggling and parents were not happy that they weren't given a choice where they could educate their children. And the first thing parents did, despite the fact that they could get a free school, is the moment they had enough money to do so, they would go and buy a private school, pay for a private school, to get their children to go there because they felt that the system the government was giving them wasn't all that good. And if you if you thought of you, I imagine you're, most of you now have driver's licenses or, or learner's permits, yeah. Have you been to the DMV before, the Department of Motor Vehicles? And there's all jokes made about it, you know, there's even one where there's a, a sloth doing the paperwork and stuff like that. The concept is nobody's very happy usually. I've been to it and I've stood in line for like an hour and a half and you get to the end and you hand them your paper and they say you're missing one paper and you're like what do you mean and he goes oh this one's not good enough you got to bring another one and you go back home and come back the next day and stand in line again it's that sort of the way the system was not working and the education system what was really not working all that well following a similar model the monopoly so the, back in Minnesota in 1991 so it's been a while um, a group of folks started nationally thinking about it, and the first law was, was written in Minnesota, was created the first charter school in the country. And I've actually known the, the lady who filed the first charter school law, who was a sponsor of it in, in the Senate in Minnesota. Her, her name is Ember, Ember Young. Nice, you know, wonderful lady. She was a state senator. She was the one that filed the first charter school statute back in 1991, and the first charter school started in America in 92. Now, what is a charter school? It was, the idea behind it is quite simple. That community organizations or municipalities, cities, or groups of parents could come together in a nonprofit, establish a nonprofit organization and petition the, the local district or the state to give them a charter, which is a contract. And that charter would say, you're allowed to operate a public school. That's why they're called a charter school, a public charter school. And the government will give you the money, a flat amount, you know, set amount per student for them to go to your charter school. And you, you're, it's your duty then to educate them. We'll pay, you educate, and then I'll prove to us in your petition, in your application, that you're worthy of receiving this contract and that you're going to do a good job. And you're going to be entirely accountable, by the way. You're going to take the state tests, all of you are familiar, because you've taken the FSA and you've taken other state-type exams that, 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 that measure how much you're learning, possibly, but somewhat measure what you're learning. And you've all been part of this, this other system, which is you belong to a school that, that, requires, that is required to account completely and entirely every year for every penny that it receives from the government. So there are auditors, independent auditors, that come in to Matter every year and to Somerset and Pinecrest and Doral. They audit the books, they review their financial statements, they review your bank accounts, and then report back to the government, to the school district, to the state, and to the federal government, and to the public, how the money was used. So this has been going on since 1992 in Minnesota, and in 1996 in Florida, Governor Lawton Childs, who was governor at the time, passed a similar law, a charter school law. So that was the first time you could start a charter in Florida, and I was one of the people, because I didn't know any better, just I thought it was a cool idea, that did that. And I started a school in Broward County because I was building communities, and I thought, I was building these big communities for families, young families, and they were starter home communities, meaning these were, were young couples 
many of them who were just starting to have children would move and buy their first home. And one of the first questions that a young couple that's looking to have children or has young children asks when they show up in your community to buy a house from you, if any of you can guess, is how are the schools? Because that's, it's logical. So I had been doing that for a number of years. I was building these very large communities. In fact, well, the one I was building where we did the first school had 2,000 homes planned. So think about it. It's like a small city. And I could do everything. I, I, I was building a park. We were building a recreation center. We had an area for commercial development so there could be a shopping center with you know a pizza place and and a movie theater and and God knows what else but the only thing we had no control of as a developer as a community developer at the time was I had no control over the schools you know private school like I mentioned earlier was inaccessible to most people and especially young families were buying their first home they could not afford that so I had no control over the public school that they would likely send their children. But I knew one thing, and I'm, it was not a good one. Many of the communities where I was building, when they would ask me, how are the local schools, I had to say, honestly, they're overcrowded, they're not very good, and your child probably won't learn anything if they go to that particular school that's serving this neighborhood. But would you like to buy a house? And that's not a great proposition, right? If you're trying to get someone to buy a house, and you're trying to provide a really nice community because I wanted to, to build places, you know, with lakes and, and uh, water resources for the kids, like a parks and all these things, but I couldn't control the schools. Um, it was terrible to tell folks, hey, move here, but I have no control over the schools and they're not very good. Fortunately, 96 came around and Florida adopted this charter school law and I was given an opportunity to do that. And I did. I, 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 by trade, let's say, or by background, I happened to be a lawyer, and I also happened to be an accountant. So it helped. I understood finance, and I understood the law, and I understood real estate because I developed it for, for a living. So, and again, that's, this is like when you're planning careers in the future, it's helpful to know those things like the law, business, and uh, and finance, those are good things. So think about it if you're thinking of becoming a psychologist. But on the other hand, the, um, what, I, what, I, what I did was look, researched everything. I prepared with the help of a consultant, prepared a petition, started the first, one of the first charter schools in Florida. And it was called Somerset because the community I was building was called Somerset at the time. That a year later, I started another school. I used to volunteer as a child at a place called Centro Mate. And my mom was one of the founders of Centro Mate. I don't know if any of you went to Centro Mate nearby. Okay, there you go, which is a beautiful place. Well, my mom was one of the people that helped start it 50 years ago when I was like, actually, maybe 51 years ago because I was eight years old. And um, that was a beautiful place. That, that, sh that she helped start with other ladies and with a, with a, with a nun of the Sacred Heart that was like a child care and, and after school um, organization. So kids could go after school and play and do their homework and or if they were pre-K, they could go to do pre-kindergarten at Centro Mater. So the f 1997, I, uh, I met with the former director, Miriam Roman, who was, I ran into her here in Hialeah Gardens. And I mentioned to her, and she knew I had started the first Somerset school. And she asked me, hey, could you help Centro Mate start a school? Because we have a building, and the kids only get here after school, the majority of them. So we have empty classrooms during the day. So I said, absolutely not. It's way too much work. But I did it anyway, because she was very persistent. So it's good to be persistent. She would call me and say, please file the application. Please, let's do it. And I did. I filed an application here in Miami. And uh, sure enough, a few months later, they called me. And they actually said they, they really liked the application. They loved Centro Mater. And they wanted us to, uh, to open a school. And we did the, the following school year. So that's where Matter Academy comes from. 
And that was just the little beginning of this. And we were kind of flying by the seat of our pants initially because we were trying to build it. It's like building an airplane while you're flying it. It's a lot of work and it's, and it's complicated. Fortunately, a lot of really smart and great educators were out there who believed in the same mission we did, which is we really believe that if you gave parents the opportunity to choose the school they could send their children to, and that there was no financial impediment for them to do so, meaning they didn't have to pay tuition, that they would choose really good schools, right? So then what is the trick? You gotta build a really good school. And that's what started to happen. Initially, I was really scared because the first year I, I, we did Somerset, the scores came back and they were dismally low. The school was scoring 30% below state, local and national averages. So that was scary. But we didn't realize at the time, and as you and I had mentioned, this, there were a lot of parents who were very unhappy with the schools that their children were attending. So those parents were the first to come over to Somerset when that school opened. And they came from all over, even though we only had 50 spots, 52 spots for, for kids. They came from as far as 15 miles away. And many, actually all of the students, were really, really struggling. They were like two and three years behind grade level when they got to Somerset that first year. So as you can imagine, when we got our scores back at the end of the year, they were really low. But that's because they were even lower when they got there. And we didn't know, we didn't know this. We just thought this thing, I, at least I did, I was like, wow, this is not, this charter school stuff is not all that great because the kids are not learning anything. They're really scoring low. Fortunately, Again, we persisted for at least one more year, and, I, and we kept working at it. We had these two great teachers initially. It was Dr. Ruth Jacoby and Janine Sadesky. And they did, they had, all we had was two classrooms. And in one of the classrooms, there were 25 students or 26, and the other, another 26. One classroom was kindergarten, first and second grade altogether. And the other classroom was third, fourth, and fifth grade altogether. Now, Shani and Dr. Ruth are still with us 20-some years later, and they're both principals, and they've had really great careers. So I just want to give you a sense of how little this whole thing started. And um, the second year, I was fearing, okay, now we'll close down because we'll get equally dismal results, right? And instead, it flipped. Instead of being 30% below state, local, and national averages, this little Somerset school leapfrogged and now was 30 points above in one year. You remember, the first year, all you were doing is measuring how tall you were when you got there, meaning they didn't have a chance to grow much, the students, because they were very short, you know, and as far as if you use the analogy of height with learning. But they were not. They, they, they got there and they barely knew, you know, how to read, and even though they were in fourth and fifth grade, some of them. A year later, they were ahead of the curve. Now they were almost one year ahead of the, of the grade level they were in. So a third grader was reading at a fourth grade level. And that was great. That was like a life-affirming reaction or change. And, and for me, it proved to me at least, or began to prove to me that we were onto something special. That if we found the right school leaders and the right teachers, and we gave them a lot of freedom so that they could do the things that they had been trained to do when they went to college and studied to become teachers and school leaders, that you could get great outcomes. But you had to give them freedom and you had to support them, right? And that's what we did. We, we, we did that at Somerset and then we did it again at Mater. And Mater began with over at Central Mater nearby with three classrooms. And those of you who've been there know there's like three rooms that look out across the lake on the uh, southernmost building, on the building in the back. That's where the first three Matter Academy classrooms were, here in Hialeah Gardens. And same thing happened. It was Miss Gilarte Gill, and I don't know if any of you had Miss Gilarte as a, as a principal when you were in Little Matter. Well, that was 20 years ago. And she was the first principal. She was a principal slash lead teacher that first year there were only 75 students and they were in three classrooms also mixed up we didn't really 
back then we were innovating. Part of what we wanted to do was change the approach. And we did start with a, what we called a mixed age model. We really said, look, if you're doing third grade level work and you're in first grade, that's okay. We'll, we'll put you with the third graders for that class. So we allowed a lot of flexibility in the program. Over time that changed, but nevertheless, the, the teachers that were there, maybe you may remember the, the one of the three was Sheila Gonzalez, who, who is now a principal at Another Matter in Coconut Grove. But she was there right from year one. And that's one of the cool things is these, the people that helped start this, who helped start this 20 years ago, are still here. And a few years later, then we started doing something which was a little crazier. We got into, because these were all K-5s initially, then we said, hey, let's do middle school and let's do high school. And then we went, that was completely crazy. And like sometimes you're better off, you know, lucky than smart because high schools are another thing. They're much more complicated. But then we had individuals like Judy Marty, who's here today, who was the founding principal of this school. And Ms. Marty, we didn't even get to hire her. She hired herself. She came and <laughs> met with us, as you guys know her probably as she is, so she came in and interviewed. These are like interview tips. When you go get a job, I guess it worked out for Judy. She just, she came and we met and we, then she said, I'll come back in two, three days. She came back two, three days later and said, you know what? I've decided I'm gonna work with you guys. I'm gonna open that school. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And we were like, great, awesome. I'll begin, I'll start two weeks. I gotta get my notice, sayonara, see you soon. She left and then Maggie, my wife, who, who works with me and I looked at each other and say, but we never offered her a job. How did it? <laughs> and and uh, but that was great, right? See, that just shows you the type of people that have helped build these these schools that now you you go to. And in fact, you probably were just about at the time when Judy joined us was right about when you guys were being born, you know, or thereabouts. Because uh, when was it? Two thousand two. When anybody born here in two thousand two? There you go. There's uh, some in the back. So, you, you know, Judy Marty was, came in and decided to build this place and was joined shortly thereafter with your, by your current principal, Tiger, Tiger Nunez, to run this place. Um, and it was, again, a, an amazing journey because now you're one of the largest charter schools in the nation, not to mention one of the highest achieving. And, and I don't know. Do you, do you guys know that? I mean, I, I don't, I, do they tell you that kind of stuff? That you're not the largest because that's just a statistic. Do you guys know that you're one of the best schools in the country? Oh, it's on the poster outside. <laughs> I, figured, I figured somebody would be, you know, uh, uh, reminding you. Because over the time, we've built. We've built. We now, so what, what happened was this started happening time and again. And we'll got to keep reminding you, you're one of the best schools in the country. That's a great thing. You're actually so good that there's statistics out there that say that the city of Hialeah, Hialeah Gardens, Hialeah included, has the lowest achievement gap in the nation right now between like, okay, let me explain. And in, in most of the country, there's this achievement gap you can read about between like what they say are low income families and high income families. There's a gap. The uh, high-income families, the kids are doing great. They show, you know, the schools that they go to perform really well. And I'll tell you, this is one of the most maddening statistics because it really angers me. I used to go, and there's the uh, new U.S. News and World Report, right? They re and you've heard of it, Newsweek, too. They rank the best high schools in America, right? Well, there's 22,000 high schools. If you look at behind the data, you'll see there are 22,000 high schools in America. And they say, we rank the top 1,000. Okay, so now let me ask you, we'll do like a show and tell or a question or whatever. I'll ask you a question. Well, I'll give you some statistics first because you guys know some stats. About more than half the schools in the country of those 22,000 schools, more than half of them, more than half the kids are on free and reduced lunch, right? They get free lunch because of the income that they, they report. So that's good. They, they, they don't have to pay for lunch and, and it helps. That, so their parents don't have to pay for that and take it out of their household budget. So now that we've established half those schools in the country, in Florida, 60% of the schools in Florida 
have more than half the students, let's say, on free and reduced lunch. So, out of the thousand best high schools in America, how many do you think have more than half the kids on free and reduced lunch? We know 600 of them about, it should be if it was, if things were all equal, more than half of them of those thousand would be have more than half the kids on free and reduced lunch, right? Yeah, it w I thought so. I would expect that. When I looked at the data, because initially they didn't report it. It was missing. So I had to go and we had to get, scrub the web and get the information, find out what the FRL rate. So, un you know, when we first saw it out of the, th first year I looked at it, that we were able to get the data. You know that out of a thousand of the, the top, top 1,000 schools, only 16 schools, not even 16%, only 16 schools had more than half the kids on free and reduced lunch. So your chance, that means 2% of the top schools in the country had more than half the kids on free and reduced. These are public schools, by the way. So how can you say that this is the land of opportunity, the greatest nation on earth, where everybody has equal opportunity and everybody has a chance when the best schools that are public are not accessible to low-income people, right? That's, a, that's criminal. The next year, I thought, well, this is going to get better. This can't be, you know. So let's see, there's probably a trend. And if this is going to get better. So next year, I'll sit and wait. I'm going to look at these numbers again, and it'll probably be 30 schools. It'll grow. Eventually, every school, you know, half the schools at least should be that way because America is a great place and everybody's equal, and everybody has the same opportunities. And if we're doing our jobs as public officials, right, the school board members and the superintendents in our nation, they want to do what's right for our kids. They're going to make sure that the best schools are in every neighborhood and it's not only the, the rich neighborhoods, right? So the next year I looked at it, and you know how many schools there were on the list year two? 14? Mm, eight. So half the schools that were on the list the year before where more than half the kids were free lunch disappeared. Now it was not even 1%. 1,000 schools, eight schools. Should have been 10 for 1%, right? Even I can do that math. So think about it. That's something terribly unfair, unjust, happening in our traditional public school system. And we're celebrating rich people's schools, and we're not doing anything to help everyone else, or very little. We're doing a lot. We're spending a lot of money, but we're very getting very poor results. Now, I was able to do one thing. It was a little growing piece of that list. At the time, it was only like 6% of the schools, because charter schools only represent about 6% of the schools out there. Now it's a little more. But there was this emerging group of schools called charter schools that were on the list. So I, what I was describing were the traditional public schools. The charter schools, on the other hand, almost 69%, almost 70% of the charter schools on that list were serving students were more than half of the students were on free and reduced lunch. So something was going on with the charter schools that was not happening with the traditional public schools. That even in neighborhoods where there was no, where you could not find anywhere in America a top-ranked traditional public school, you somehow now had a top-ranked charter school. Charter schools were making the list. You guys were making the list, by the way. Matter Academy was in that list. Doral was on that list. You know, Somerset was on that list. The International Studies Charter High School was on the list. They were on that list of the best high schools, the thousand best high schools in America. And every single one of them that was making that list had more than half the students on free and reduced lunch. So we were doing something that had never been done in the country. In fact, it was going sliding in the opposite direction, the wrong way. And the charter schools were actually getting these amazing outcomes. And I, it wasn't just us, although we are leading the way. The group of schools that we work with I had created an organization about two years into the process called Academica, and what we do is work with the charter schools to help them start, to support them, to get them financing, to get them facilities, to help your administrators find great teachers, and then to manage the whole process and then do this compliance that I was talking to you about to make sure that the public knows, what is, knows everything that's going on in the classroom and in the school. So, the data now started to show this, that the charter schools were, were getting these phenomenal results 
in, in neighborhoods that had never seen anything like it. And this is an example of it in Little Havana, where Matter had another location, is another example. And you can see that time and again. And there's been other, other statistics and other, other studies subsequent to, to the information that I was describing that showed you the exact same thing. That in all over the country, the charter schools were making a big difference. And that you're now part of a family of charter schools that's making the biggest, among the biggest impact in, in, in neighborhoods around the country. As part of the work we did, we, we, we kept growing. And now, today, I believe the family of schools that Academica works with, we have close to 200 schools in the country. And like I say, it goes all the way from Key West to Hawaii. So it's a very big geography, the entire nation. And, um, and so you're part of a family of schools, and your you're, 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 you're brothers and sisters and other schools out there are stretch across the United States and all its time zones and has students in every grade level from pre-kindergarten through college. Part of what we wanted to do, and we've been doing all along, and we can't stop doing, meaning we'll keep doing, is um, in, uh, in, how do you say, uh, innovating, in creating something new and different. So among the things we've done, uh, I don't know how many of you are in that program, is we've created a college called Doral College. And that, and Judy Marty will, is joining the board of that college now. Um, but, the, but we have a, a college that we created so that in your high schools, you could get dual credit for college level work. That's among the things that make these the best high schools in the country, is your ability to access college level work so that you're that far ahead of, your, of the students you're competing with against, you know, around the country. We want you to get into the best colleges and, it's, and you have obviously an edge in doing that if you already get there with a substantial amount of college work done. So we kind of we developed that program as well. And we've been trying to innovate and in that regard as also, and also in connecting more and more students together. So with the advent of online learning, oh, there's a lot of cute kids on the <laughs> photograph there. The, uh, with the advent of online learning, we did that as well. We created a dual, an international dual diploma program. And I would love for, for you in the future and those of you who are watching to be part of this one way or the other. What we're creating as part of Academica's role is an international community of learners, connecting people and students around the world, connecting them together. And this is an example. This, this conversation today, with a, which is more of a monologue than a conversation, we'll flip that around in a minute. Um, the idea behind this is to connect schools and students from around the world and do so not just in presentations like this, but allow you to do so, so that going forward you could be taking a class here in the United States and collaborating with students perhaps in Europe or in Latin America or in Asia and share your, your knowledge and really work together in a different kind of social network. Unfortunately, many of you, most of you, or probably all of you, are somehow connected on right now in a, in a social network, right? It's whether it's Facebook or which I doubt because most of you are too young for Facebook, but um, Instagram or Snapchat or one of these other tools. Um, and as you know, you spend a lot of time with these things. I'm not sure how social they really help make you, um, and and they're not used enough for what to really add value to your lives, right? Now, if on the other hand, you can connect with other students and you have a, a subject that you're all working on together, you're doing like a group project, but imagine that that group project involves you here, someone else in Italy, someone else in Spain, and someone in Latin America someplace, Colombia or Venezuela. Well, Venezuela right now, I don't know if, if you could do it, but, but in one of the other countries where I, there's a little more freedom, um, then imagine how much how much work you could do and how, how, how cool that would be for not only for them, for those students, for yourselves, and for your ability to communicate and develop a better knowledge of the subjects you're working on together. So that's kind of the things we're working on. We have 
thousands of students in Europe right now that work with us on, a, on that international dual diploma program. And we're continuing to develop this, this activity further. So I know I left you off where we started Matter Academy and then the subsequent year was Doral, then Pinecrest Academy, and then the Children's Museum and then International Studies Charter School. So all those things happen every year we would continue to grow. And as I said, we've now grown to the point where we have the largest platform of, of schools, charter schools, collaborating together in the country. And that's part of the big thing that, that, that we really believe in and I, I believe in is that you're best when you collaborate, when you work together on stuff. So even though you're also competing, one of the reasons you're wearing uniforms is that when you come to school, just like you would with a, I, I don't, I'm okay with the water right now. I don't want to look, you know, pull up Marco Rubio. And, <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 when you come to school every, every day, we talked about earlier about the, the exams, right, that you have to take. And that's your measure. You're being measured. Your learning is being measured. Your school's being evaluated. Your teachers are being evaluated on the basis of what you are learning. And that's, you know, a lot of people think that's unfair because what if you really don't care about what you learn? We have a question for this, right? You guys care deeply. They want to know, you learn it, would it ever be possible the if they the could get you, middle school credits while in fifth grade? They care about it. And part of the I think that's a, yeah, we, 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 give, we give we give college credit while you're in high school and even some middle schools, you should you definitely. Stuff. You know, just learning for learning's sake is, is cool and, and it's really good. But if we can figure out a way to, to make it relevant to you and for you to understand the value of having that knowledge and why it, what it means to you in becoming a more like a happier person in, in your life, if you have a better understanding of the world around you and how you got here and where you're going, well, then, then that's where you start realizing the value of, of what these folks that, that work for you here in, in Matter Academy and at your schools, what they represent. And that's what we try to do is kind of energize and work to get each other and work together to continue this, this journey that we're in to help have the best education system in the nation. And, and even now, the guys, the folks over at Stanford University, and there's a bunch bunch of batter students in Stanford right now. They have a, uh, uh, an institute there called Credo, Credo, you know, the Center for Research on Education and Outcomes. And um, they wrote a study about a year ago, and it said exactly what, what I was telling you earlier, that the students who are going to the schools that we work with, they de designated those hybrid schools, and I'll explain what hybrid charter schools are. Uh, basically, charter schools working the way we do, the ones that work with Academica, that have this kind of like situation where you collaborate and compete with each other. We have, you know, where the Matter Academies compete with the Doral's and the Pinecrest and, the, and, and Somersets, but they compete, but they also cooperate. So that's what Academica tries to accomplish, is get you guys to compete and cooperate. You come to school wearing uniforms like you would if you went on a field to play another team. You're all part of the same team, you're all playing, wearing the same uniform, different than what Somerset's wearing a few miles down the road. And Somerset's competing against you every day when they come to school. They're competing because they're competing by studying and by planning to take an exam and beat you guys at that exam at the end of the year. Because at the end of the year, I can assure you, we all look at the results. The principals all go and share the results and if Judy Marty's or Tiger Nunez school has a higher grade than the Somerset in Broward, they have bragging rights, they won. And that's part of what it is, you're competing. Now, it's a friendly competition, you help each other. Then we go and at the same meeting where we, 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 we award people and tell them congratulations for the great job you're doing, um, and they can brag about having won, meaning having a higher grade, then they go back into a new meeting and start sharing what they did to get that higher grade. So why? Because it's cool. That way, we're all playing on the same, in the same turf, in the same field. We're sharing our secrets, our playbook. And that's, that's different. That's not how most sports teams work, right? But they do look at the film from the last game and their competitors' games, right? When you're going to go play, when, when the Dolphins are going to go play the Jets, if the Jets still exist, I don't even know, I don't follow. Uh, oh, okay, there you go. 
Well, in preparation for the game, what do you do? You look at video of the plays that the Jets run, ran in the past. And, and so, because you want to be better than they are when you get on the field. And like I said, you're on the field every day. You come to the classroom to prepare. And we already know what Somerset's playbook looks like when you're at Matter. Matter, Somerset knows what the Matter playbook is. And Doral and, and uh, Pinecrest all know. And that's great because we actually know the plays there. We're all running. We just got to figure out how to do it better and work harder than the other teams so that you come out on top when, when it's time to look at the, at the results. What I can tell you, and you guys all know, is that by and large, you know, the schools we work with collectively, we, when they grade them, they're all, the vast majority are A's. And those that aren't are working, and we're collaborating together with them, with other schools, to ensure that they get there. Because the goal is for everybody, that's the great thing. Unlike a trophy in a, like the Super Bowl, that only one of the teams can walk away with the trophy and the other one walks away empty-handed, in the game we're playing, everybody gets to walk away with the trophy, which is that the, the, the A grade they're trying to get, trying to get the highest graduation rate. There's nobody, nothing prevents you from getting 100% graduation rate. You don't have, nobody has to lose. We can all win. So that's the beauty of competing while at the same time cooperating. Why we cooperate? Because at the end, we can all, we're all trying to accomplish the same things, and we all can. It isn't like a win-lose proposition. It's potentially a win-win proposition. Now, if you got a few extra points above Somerset, you're going to feel good. But, uh, but you know what, but the following year, it probably will flip the other way because they'll know what, what play you ran. So I don't know if there's any, uh, I mean, I mentioned the Stanford report that they, they identified the types of schools we operate. And I don't think I did tell you that their results showed that for, like, you guys are now seniors in high school, right? And that means you did four years of high school, except for a few of you that may have done five or six. But, uh, but for the most part, if you did four years of high school, according to Stanford, and you went to a school where you went here to matter, you, you got at least probably closer to five years worth of, of knowledge in those four years. That's how they, that's part of the analysis they did. What they do is they calculated a number of extra days learning. Some schools have deficits. You go to those schools and in four years you get three years worth of knowledge. In the case of the Matter Academy schools, the Doral Academy schools, Somerset, Pinecrest, in those schools, for every day you were there, you were getting more than one day's worth of, of growth, of learning. And that's fascinating. I know we, we didn't even know they were doing this study. So when it came out, it was great to see, it was like really cool to see that, 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 in, uh, that you guys were doing so well. I mean, you knew, we knew you were doing well because you're doing well on, all, on many other metrics. You're on these top 1,000 lists, as the poster says, and you were on these, uh, all these other things that, that, that show that you've done a great job. But now you have one of the top research universities in the nation that has analyzed it and saying, hey, these kids are really learning a lot. They're learning more. They're going to high school, but they're leaving high school as if they had done high school plus an extra year of college. There are other metrics too that, 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 that are helpful for you to understand, getting a phone call, um, is that the, in addition to that extra learning, what does this translate into your lives and your futures? They did a study, a couple of, well, people are studying that now. Did a study about three years ago in a university in Georgia, and they tracked the performance of, of charter school students, students who were in charter schools. They, they, they identified them when they were in eighth grade and that had been in charter school from eighth grade on or ninth grade on, and they found out what they were doing eight years later after they graduated from college and even if they didn't go to college. And when compared it to how students in the district, traditional public schools were doing in their lives and in their careers. What they found was very interesting, that the students that went to the charter schools were persisting more in college, meaning they were less likely to drop out of college. 
So more of them were completing college. And then they also found that whether they completed college or not, but the vast majority did, they were earning more. So four years out, they were earning on average like $3,000 more per year per student than the ones that did not go to the charter schools. Now that's a big deal because as a percentage, remember these are young people and what they're earning and on the average being $3,000, it was, it was an unexpected finding and it, it was pervasive, meaning it didn't matter. Even if, if they compared a student that hadn't finished college but had gone to a charter school to one who hadn't finished college and had gone to a traditional public school, the one who had gone to the charter school was still earning more, close to $3,000 more. So think about that. You know, what I think that demonstrates is that I talk to you about the stuff we do measure, right? We can measure your math knowledge, how well you read, and how well you write in these tests. And it, but it's hard to measure things like your, how, how persistent you guys are, how conscientious you are, how hard you're willing to work to do things, you know, to, to uh, you know, have other, to not let other people down, which is a big deal, you know. And that's, by the way, one of the biggest deals is people who are conscientious who don't want to let other people down do better. You don't, it's not just being smarter and doing better in school. It's also caring about how you are when it comes to how dependable you are and the work you do in your lives. But what we're learning now is that some of these more difficult to measure things, we don't have a test for that while you're in school, right? Um, because it would be more of an attitude test and they would be asking, well, well are, you, are you dependable? Most people are going to put, yeah. So, I mean, it's not like you can put, how dependable are you on a scale of 1 to 10? Things like that. But what we're knowing is that the, for whatever reason, and we don't know that yet, the why, but we know that the fact that you're in this type of educational model and in this kind of program is having some lasting impacts on your careers and your futures. I think it's obviously... The part of it is the, the, the folks that, that you work with, meaning the teachers and that, that are here that are educating you and, and the type of person that we select, that we as an organization will select to work with you in a charter school. And the fact that we have a lot of freedom in that and that we get to work with them and find what we believe to be some of the best educators around. And it's a challenge because, you know, it's a competitive world out there especially now that there are charter schools. We'll take some questions um, from Nevada. What's your most challenging part of your job? That's a great question. I don't think I know the answer to it. Um, I mean, it's where to go next. Where to go next with what we do. We, we, uh, we're, we're constantly trying to innovate and we work together with a team of, of people to try to figure out what the future is for you, meaning what do you do? Like what, our job, and that's very important, and I you know you got a skeptical face on, but uh, <laughs> the biggest part of our job is making sure we're doing the right job mm -hmm. because we know how to get you to, we're pretty good at getting you to do well in math and reading and stuff, but are we, what do we really need to do to, prepare you to be successful when you grow up. And in your case, who's asking the question, um, that's a ways off still, right? Because you're, what grade are you in? Fifth grade. Fifth grade. <laughs> are, are you in, you're in Nevada right now? Yes. In which school? Pinecrest Academy, St. Rose. Ooh, Pinecrest. Pinecrest Academy in Nevada, which Judy Marty is the chairman here of the Pinecrest Florida Network and been going to Nevada like every week, I think, working with the team there. Um, so you guys to know, but Pinecrest Network in Nevada is now the highest performing charter school network in the entire state of Nevada. So that we just found that out this year. I think you have like five schools, four or five, five schools in Nevada. And congratulations, because the biggest challenge in our job is keeping the peace between these networks of schools because now Pinecrest is bragging about being the best in all of Nevada and now we have the other networks right on their tail trying to become the best. If we can. 
Here we go. I know you are aware of the research being done on what works and doesn't work. I know we are aware that music education is a key component of building great thinkers, leaders, and artists. That's a loaded question. How committed is your organization to providing music education? Well, I personally, and Antonio mentioned it earlier, I happen to be a musician. And I write music, I used to play in a band, I'm not doing it right now because I got a little busy right now, but I write music, I write, play guitar, play bass, play percussion, and I think it's critical. It's not just critical to, um, to you know, just for fun, but I think it helps a lot. I have three daughters in, um, in Somerset right now, and I hate to, you know, point out it's another network, it just happens to be the one closest to my house, but my three daughters, um, they all, we all make, make all of them, obligate them all to, turn, to learn piano, for example. They get a piano teacher they have to go to, and they take dance. And one of the things we've done, and we have it here at Matter, we've done in almost every network we're with, is that you have these performing arts and education academies. And the reason we created these academies was twofold. One, to give opportunities to students who wanted to focus their careers or their future in the arts, and then make it available to them so you have it here. It's wonderful and I'm sure you've, over the years, been you've, either you're part of it or you've been to, to the performances and you do amazing work. In fact, we're working now on interdisciplinary projects like this. So I'll give you an example. We're committed in the sense that in the next couple of weeks we're gonna be launching the first ever Sirius XM uh, radio station run entirely by students, charter school students. The station was given to, you know, granted the license to us by Sirius XM. It's going to be the, the, the first uh, record, uh, station location is at SLAM, but it's being designed to connect with every single school so that going forward, students from every school that we work with could participate and, and, and be part of that radio programming. Now radio programming will include talk radio, but also a big chunk of it, probably half of it, will be music. And it'll be student, what we're trying to do is make sure it's student curated and student created music. So that's just one example. We're working on another project right now with, you're familiar with the Telemundo networks? Okay, so it's one of the largest uh, Spanish language television networks, but that's also part of NBC, Comcast, and Universal Pictures. So this last year, to, we started the first Telemundo Academy, and that one also will be collaborating. The, the scholars will come from any one of these schools that can be part of it and do it from here, and then once in a while you go over to the Telemundo headquarters, which are just west of Doral, but working on careers in broadcasting, in the arts, in music, and in performance, if you want to act, if you want to uh, perform, all of that will be part of these cohorts of students that are pursuing careers. And obviously what we're looking to do is work back to ensure that every grade level and every part of the organization that the parents and the students have access to that. Now, some of these programs, like I said, in schools, now what can we do within the existing schools? And that is, you know, what we can do is obviously offer our music and arts classes, but what we're trying to make sure is we have these outlets so that if, if you want to develop a talent or a specialty in the arts, that we are giving you the opportunity to do so, so you don't have to wait till you finish high school or till you finish college to pursue that dream that you can start doing it right from school when you when you get there. We got a high school crush in fifth grade. They want to know, it, would it ever be possible if they could get middle school credits while in fifth grade? Oh, oh. I think, I that's, think that's a, yeah, yeah. We, 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 give, we give college credit while you're in high school and even some middle schools. You should definitely, if you're not getting it, somebody should be giving you middle school credit for middle school level work while you're in fifth grade, absolutely. I just don't know, I, I'd have to know the details of your program, but I can assure you that that's part, that's the big thing of what we're about. If you can do work 
at a higher level, you should get the credit for it. So I think uh, that's a great class. <laughs> I think um, that's an engaged class. Yeah, I, I think we want to take a, a couple of questions from our international students. Okay. Perhaps uh, someone from Italy, or France, or Spain. Um, I'm Lucia from Spain. I'm, uh, oh, Spain. Um, what would you recommend to a foreign student uh, that wants to attend a university? That wants to come to a university in the United States? Well, do a diploma. Yeah, well, we have, and, I, and you're on it. <laughs> you happen to be in the dual, you're in the dual diploma program, I imagine, correct? And the dual diploma program already gives you that program we were talking about. When she graduates from it, she'll have a U.S. high school diploma in Spain. And that actually helps you. It makes it easier to transfer because your credits is fully accredited. Just like if you came here to Matter Academy, Lucia will be able to have a, um, a diploma that's valid any, to pretty much any, any college in the United States. So it allows you to do that. One of the good things that we have nowadays is that more and more we're connecting across the world with our schools. So our college, Doral, College is also part of the dual degree program. So Lucia, one of the things you'll be able to do is even if you, for whatever reason, can't make it to the United States to come study during college, college from the United States will be able to go to you like your dual diploma program. So you'll be able to get dual credit for the career you study in Spain. So if you, let's say you want to be a teacher in Spain, and you're studying magisterio or teaching. When you graduate, if you go in that kind of a program, just like you're doing in high school now, when you graduate in Spain, you will get two degrees. You will get a European teaching degree, and you will get an American teaching degree. And that's really cool, because that will allow you to then come to the United States as a teacher. If you get, and you, got, you have to go through a, um, a visa process for that, but there are visas for that and you can come to the United States there's one that we use every year some of you may have had teachers visiting from another country and I see you nodding and those are teachers that we go every year to Spain for example and we hire teachers to come to the United States for three years under that visa program so that the students in in America can have teachers that they meet and that they work with from other countries so we do that every year and that's an example of how that dual college, dual degree program works. I think you have a question from Julia. Uh, I'm Julia and I'm Italian. I have a question. Uh, when I go um, study in America, um, many university includes uh, uh, a place where I can stay during my studies or I have to find it by myself. The answer is yes. <laughs> you have, you know, many universities in the United States have what they call student housing. So when you go to the university, housing is available that you can buy or rent while you're attending. That's part of your, your university uh, experience. Um, a lot of students do that initially, and then there's also often additional housing near the school that you can select usually like in your third year second third or fourth year um, some students will move what they call off campus they won't be living at the school but they'll be living very nearby in apartments nearby so yeah, that's very common in america uh, um, hello i'm from france and i have a question um does the dual diploma program can take um the scholarship um expenses like can pay the scholarship expense. If you have high enough grades, you can qualify for certain scholarships. So the dual diploma, because you're, you will have an American high school diploma with all your grades. So the way that works, and maybe, I don't know if you have any students like that here this year, but you know when a student comes in in your 11th grade or in your 10th or 12th grade, 
for a year or two. When they graduate from here, they still have a full, so what the school does is it recognizes all of the courses and all the grades from the other school that they went to. Well, the dual diploma does that. What we do is we work with schools in Europe, for example, and your case in France, and we give you credit for the work you're doing in France. So on your transcript, you have a transcript from an American private high school, and that high school transcript will contain all your work from both Europe and the United States. So when you present that to a college here in the United States, if that great work is sufficient to merit a scholarship and you have all the qualifications otherwise for it, then you, you can receive it. You can get it. Yeah. Because it's fully accredited, meaning the, the diploma you will have has the same level of accreditation nationally here as, as this school does, as Matter Academy or any school that is fully accredited. Thanks for your question. We're going to take one more question from Mr. Fang Hu's class at Somerset Kilmi. Oh, great. Very familiar with that school. That's where my three daughters go. And my three, and my three sons. sons. And his three sons. In roughly the same grades. There you are. There we go. We got a question. Somerset seventh grade civics class would like to know, where do you see charter schools in academica 10 years from now? And what are goals that have not accomplished yet? Okay. This is what I can definitely tell you that we're trying, one of the goals. And I think we'll get there w less than 10 years from now, and you will all be terribly disappointed who are sitting here today and are seniors or juniors. <laughs> because 10 years from now, you would all be graduating, in my opinion. We are working so that all of you would be graduating with four years of college right now. Okay? So I don't know if you're disappointed or happy that you didn't have to take four years of college while you were in high school. But that's one of our goals. And I really think we're going to get there. Because more and more of us, of you guys, are graduating with two years of college already or a lot of college credit, right? So this is a real goal. This is not, I'm, just, I'm not making this up. This is the kind of thing we're working on. So since we've already gotten that far down the line, the next step, and I would like you to each consider coming back and working with us to help accomplish that goal. Because you won't be able to do it as a student, but perhaps you can do it as a teacher or a professor in our college. And what we're going to do, we're not, we don't think we're going to get there. We're going to get there and we're going to get there sooner than four years from now. Is that when we're here talking to a group of seniors it, in high school, they will also be seniors in college. And don't worry, you'll still get to go to college if that's what you want to do. The difference will be that when you get there, in many of the colleges, or most of them, you'll be working on a master's degree. You'll be working on a professional degree, like a law degree, or, a or you'll be going right into medical school instead of having to wait another five, four years, or three years to get into medical school or law school. That's what we want to do. That's part of our goal. And those are you, of you who are with us in seventh grade or fifth grade classes or younger, that's what we're trying to accomplish. And honestly, if we get there, that'll be a huge accomplishment. But we're going to get there. You want to go back to yours? No, no thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys are going to, are you guys going to get there? I don't know. I don't know. We need to give them a high school. First. <laughs> well, Fernando, on behalf of hey, thank you, Anthony. everybody. And thank uh, you guys. All of thank the you academic for being here. Worldwide. You guys. Thank you very much for all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you.